This episode is sponsored by Cengage. From online to high flex learning, Cengage supports your changing pedagogy at scale. Learn more at Cengage.com slash institutional. That's C-E-N-G-A-G-E dot com slash institutional. Welcome to The Key with Ai Chi. Thanks for listening. I'm Paul Fain, a contributing editor inside higher ed and the host of this podcast. With the fall term underway, community colleges and their students are wrestling with plenty of challenges, not least of them being obstacles related to affordability, childcare, and the digital divide in online learning. I spoke with two community college leaders to hear how they and their students are coping. Sue Elsperman is president of Ivy Tech Community College, Indiana's statewide system, and also a former lieutenant governor. She talked about how Ivy Tech used its federal CARES Act dollars to help students stay enrolled and what she'd like to see in a future federal stimulus. Community college students are 40% of all college students, and yet the CARES Act dollars, only 27% went to community colleges. So I think if I could ask something from the federal government, it would be to think more in terms of headcount instead of FTE, because our students, they have the bigger challenge of continuing, even if it's one course at a time, they are working, they are eking out a living, raising children while going to school. Margaret McMenamin, president of New Jersey's Union County College, told me how the college is working to make sure all students have access to online courses. She also talked about how the pandemic and the move to remote instruction is affecting Union County's enrollment. In community colleges across the country, I know certainly here in New Jersey, we've been waiting for the big rush of students who would be fleeing from the four-year colleges and entering our campuses. They didn't show up. It didn't happen. A quick note about this episode, both institutions featured work with Cengage, the sponsor of this episode, and they cited that partnership as part of the solution to students' affordability challenges. Let's get to the conversation. I'm here with President Sue Elsperman from Ivy Tech. Thanks for doing this. My pleasure, Paul, good to be with you. So challenging times for one and all. You all work with many students who come from challenging situations to begin with. How has that changed this fall? What are some of the obstacles your students are facing? Well, we have seen ever more of those. Well, first, we saw fewer in the summer. They were kind of frozen about what to do. As that unfrozenness started to happen, we saw just more challenges in terms of what they needed beyond tuition assistance. So rental assistance, housing challenges, emergency aid in that general sense of things. What helped us at Ivy Tech is we had an incredibly generous donor who gave us half a million dollars in a matching grant, and then another donor put in a hundred thousand more match. So we had 1.2 million that was totally unrestricted. And that's what we've been using to help as many students who don't qualify for the CARES Act, particularly, but need technology, need uh, some kind of assistance to be able to come back. And and we have a a department called Ivy Cares, which manages this entire process around the wraparound services. That sort of large unrestricted gift is fairly rare for a system like yours? You know, I can't even begin to describe how thankful we were for that because this happened to be a trustee of ours, Marianne Glick and her husband, Mike Woods, who really, their mission is to help our students. So our student, typically working adult, may have a family, is struggling to make ends meet on a good day. And knowing that when this pandemic hit, they would be more impacted, likely to be that server in a restaurant who's just now doesn't have a steady job, uh, but also dealing with, I mean, more and more dealing with, uh, you mentioned you have a five-year-old. Well, how many of them have a child or two or three at home that are supposed to be doing school virtually? And they may have one laptop for the entire family or devices or bare bones internet if they have it. So all the complications of their lives and having access to this 1.2 million has made such a difference in being able to 
help that student continue forward in their journey. And I know for a lot of students, that aid can be the difference between leaving higher education entirely uh, or, or sticking with it. And, and, you know, looking forward, how are you feeling in terms of enrollment? I mean, obviously the sector is, is wrestling with some big questions there. Yeah, we're, we were soft coming into this fall, a little over 10% down. Though the applicants are there, they, they came in much later, one to two months later than they had. So we're, we were still getting applicants. Now, here's the good news. Ivy Tech is a predominantly eight-week course offerings now. We've been making that transition for more than two years because adults do better with eight-week courses, 6% higher pass rates, 2% or 3% lower drop rates. It's working. But the other benefit is those who didn't get approved, you know, their financial aid, other things ready by the beginning, and we've continued to market to students we expect to see a, a nice bump in our second eight weeks, which gets people started for those who didn't think they could do it in August. Now they're realizing this is the new normal. We need, and, and we've done well. We're about a third, roughly a third of our courses have some in-person component, mostly labs and hands-on. The others, we have virtual and online. So, People are adjusting to, okay, Ivy Tech can meet me where I am. So we're hopeful that our second eight weeks will allow many more Hoosiers who want to come back or can now see their way to coming back do so. You've mentioned, obviously, emergency aid and, and aid to help students get through the challenges right now. Can you talk about what you all have done to address the digital divide, uh, broadband access, and, and, yeah. and affordability sure. measures we should be watching beyond that? We have, and I'm so proud of our Office of Information Technology, we have re-imaged more than a thousand laptops for our students. They're loaners, but they are some of our colleges' laptops as we trade them in. They are from hospitals and our state house and other places where when those come to us, we re-image them and make them available to our students. So that was a very big help through the summer particularly. Now that our campuses are back open, people can come in and use our computer labs every other seat, every third seat, et cetera, with social distancing. We also, during the beginning of the pandemic with our Wi-Fi, we directed it out into our parking lots at all of our 40 locations so people could drive in and still get homework done again. And a number of hot spots that we gave out in some areas where that, but that technology is, it is critical that our students have access to the internet, to a laptop or device that allows them to move forward. As we're, if we can maintain our level of being opened, which for us, we very purposely said, we want the lowest density of people on our campuses as possible while remaining open for those who need to be here. So those who are in a lab-based course or hands-on or just need to take a course uh, in person. We want th them to be here, their instructors, and those frontline people that they need to see. I'm in the office today, but you won't see me very often. And if you look behind me, it's all dark. There's probably three people on my floor today because we've asked and encouraged all those who can work from home to work from home and those who need to be here to serve students to be here. So that's allowing us to keep so far, we've had a, um, we keep a watch list of our 18 campuses and the additional sites across the state. If a county peaks, we watch several indicators beyond positivity rate. And then we have a watch list where, you know, we've prepared that if we need to have a campus go completely virtual for a period of time, they can do that. We've not had to just yet. Indiana is not where we want to be, but also not in a terrible place. So, I wanna make sure that Ivy Tech is part of helping Indiana with that challenge and doing everything we can to keep our density down, only having people who need to be here. You know, I think, you know, as we think, we cover uh, the challenges that college is facing right now uh, in trying to go in person and, and, you know, pivoting back and forth. The, the two year space, I'm not sure we've done enough of covering how important it is for some in-person options. 
you know, the, for these vulnerable students, for, for all students that you serve, not having access to some of this, but for the computer labs, as you mentioned, but also just the, the lab work for their, their programs is, is pretty crucial. In addition to tutoring and wraparound service and other things that if you're not computer savvy anyway, now asking them to do everything that way, including meeting with an advisor, including financial aid, including, 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 it becomes very difficult for them. So we've, we're committed to meeting our students where they are. I've been really proud of our students that they've adapted well to virtual advising. And we, again, we make both available and it's about a 50-50 split. So we're learning together, how do we best support them because they have very challenging lives and our goal is to make that. Well, I'll, I'll tell you the one model that we stood up this fall that we had been toying with for our single moms initiative that's a, a national uh, challenge we're a part of to help more single moms complete college. It's called Learn Anywhere. So in that model, they can uh, decide every week whether they wanna be in person virtual or online. So they get all three modalities in one course based on what life throws at them that week. We were going to pilot a few sections for our single moms. And then with COVID, our provost asked all of the campuses, would you consider? We had 400 sections, volunteer faculty, to try to do something pretty complicated, right? To teach three ways at once. Uh, so I couldn't be more proud of our faculty at Ivy Tech because they know the students they serve and how important it is that we flex with them, that we meet them where they are. So Learn Anywhere is now 5% of what we do, and we hope to continue growing that. That's really fascinating. I mean, e even I know flexibility is key, but it, you know, just to, to drive that home, they, they can change on a weekly basis. On a weekly basis. Wow, that's yeah. fascinating. So you've mentioned that you all use CARES Act uh, money to help students out. Can you talk about you know how you used it and, and also what you'd like to see? You know who knows what's going to happen where I am in Washington, but uh, I assume some more aid could be beneficial. So right, what would you like? So so we're we're a large college. We received thirty three million dollars in CARES Act funding. Half of that, of course, goes to the students. Very proud that within literally a week of getting the approval from USDOE we had the first half of the dollars out given the unmet need through financial aid of our students. But we knew that not all of our students had applied for financial aid and situations had changed. So this summer, we encouraged them to do that. Then we were up to like 11 and a half million given out. Now this fall, this month yet, we will send out the rest uh, based on unmet financial need for our students. So that's been good. On the colleges side, we have, of course, used it for technology, for some of the Wi-Fi, some of the things that we needed as a college to be completely virtual. But we had enough left that we did something that I think we're the first in the country to do, which is we wanted to help our students. If you know that about a quarter of community college students never buy their books, you and I can't imagine passing courses without having the learning materials. And we knew it would be particularly hard now. So we negotiated with Cengage Unlimited, which is our largest online provider, and we negotiated a statewide subscription that is now free to all of our students. So on average, we think a student is saving about $140 each semester, and we know that over 40% of our students have at least one Cengage. It's that course. It is their entire library before them, and we've bought that for the next year using those dollars. As that word's getting out, our students love it, as you can imagine. They are surprised because we really, we just inked the deal the week before classes started. So we hadn't marketed it, but when they went to get their books, all of a sudden they were told they were free. So that's a pretty nice thing to be able to do for our students. We're very excited. Our goal in the long run is to get to inclusive tuition, which would mean no book fees, that those books are included. This is a really nice step towards that. We've been doing OER for a long time, but of course not everything fits well into OER. So we are moving this way and very excited through the CARES Act to be able to do this Cengage 
uh, unlimited and hopeful that if a little additional flexibility comes that we might be able to do another year as well with the CARES Act dollars. I would think that your representatives in Washington would be happy with how Ivy Tech has used this funding. I mean, have you gotten any sense that? Uh, yeah, so if, for instance, on this, this Engage Unlimited with the subscription, we, we got some very good guidance before we did it from USDOE as well to make sure that we were all in line and that's a good thing. But I think it just speaks to the question of how can the federal government help more. We know that in Indiana, we've already been asked to take a 7% cut from our state funding this year, likely into the next year and going into a biennial budget that's gonna look awful with state revenues. Remember I was Lieutenant Governor, so I kind of remember the budget and you, there will be a lot of needs this year. So we're expecting that our funding will be hurt. The CARES Act dollars, community college students are 40% of all college students, and yet the CARES Act dollars, only 27% went to community colleges. So I think if I could ask something from the federal government, it would be to think more in terms of headcount instead of FTE because our students, they have the bigger challenge of continuing, even if it's one course at a time, they are working, they are eking out a living, raising children while going to school. They should not receive less support. They are the most at risk students in this collegiate post-secondary population. And I think there's a real opportunity for federal government, for Congress, or USDOE to be thinking about how do we support the most vulnerable? We've helped ourselves with donors like the Glicks who helped us raise that 1.2 million in totally unrestricted funds. But we really need as much help as we can on behalf of our students to ensure that they can continue because when they gain that credential, that certificate or degree, they will be able to be in a position to be that taxpayer with prosperity and continuing to skill up and, and gain more degrees over time. But we catch them at the most vulnerable point. Well, uh, that feels like a good spot to end. Uh, President Elsperman, thanks so much for your time. I know it's in short uh, supply right now and good luck to you for the rest of the fall and hope we can keep in touch. Well, thank you, Paul, for what you're doing and for helping to elevate and share the voice of community colleges, and most importantly, our students. Happy to. More of that to come. Thanks again. If you're looking to go even more in-depth in IHE's news coverage, check out our special reports. These deep dives feature rich data and reporting, as well as thoughtful, substantive analysis you can trust. Visit insidehighered.com backslash special dash reports to view the topics we've covered and to purchase the report that best supports your area of work or study. Hello, I'm speaking with President Margaret McMenamin, President of Union County College in New Jersey. How are you doing? I'm doing very well, thanks, Paul. Well, thanks for joining me. Um, obviously, not the most fun times uh, in higher education or community colleges uh, broadly. And you know, you're in a state, New Jersey, that was hit very hard uh, in the early stage of the pandemic. Can you give us a sense of how your students are doing, how they're coping with a largely online fall and how their needs have changed in the last few months? Uh, they, we got hit hard. New Jersey, we called it ground zero way back in March when we certainly were leading the nation in new cases. And we did a quick turnaround in March, went remote, moved up over a thousand sections to remote live uh, over in the course of two or three days. And frankly, our students have struggled. We are doing everything we can to help them but we know that especially the most vulnerable of our students are struggling. They're struggling to just wrap their brains and their, their minds around what this pandemic will do to them now and in the future. But they're also struggling with adjusting academically. Prior to the pandemic, I had only 10% of my credit hours came from online instruction. We are a majority, overwhelming majority, face-to-face -face instruction at Union. And when we had to flip to remote live and online in March, it was a struggle. It's not what our students want. We rely on a very high-touch, 
personalized service for these students, especially our first generation college students, and they've struggled. But they're not just struggling with worry, they're not about the pandemic, and they're not just struggling academically, they're struggling financially. And those are the kinds of things that we're trying to address with them, everything from tutoring, remote tutoring, to CARES Act funding for Wi-Fi services. They've been hit every which way that you can imagine. One of the questions I, f I feel like we haven't explored much is the, the K-12 crisis. Students at home uh, for working parents who are trying to go to school. Is that something you're seeing in your, your students? Absolutely. For working parents, definitely, who, uh, who are trying to teach their K-12 to kids while going to college simultaneously. We've seen that, and I've personally received emails from some of those students, but we also have a large number of our students who are not parent, student parents. They are having to care for and homeschool their brothers and sisters. So I have an honors student in one of my STEM programs, a chemistry major who is a star student, 3.93 GPA, but she's having to tutor her three younger brothers, not tutor them, homeschool her three younger brothers and sisters while her mother is working at one of the local hospitals. So those are the kinds of challenges for both the students who are parents but for the students who come from large families, many of our students do, they're having the obligation of having to homeschool brothers and sisters. This is a challenge. This is an extraordinary challenge for our kids. Absolutely, hard to even imagine how difficult that must be. So you mentioned using CARES Act funding uh, for wireless. Can, can you talk a little bit about the digital divide, the, the access issues that your students might have? Uh, we have a large percentage of Pell eligible students, a large percentage of first generation college students. Uh, so poor first generation, lots of immigrants, and they do not have the resources that you have or that I have. And this is part of the message that we've been trying to get across, not just to our staff and our faculty, but also to our donors. So our students relied on the college for high-speed internet access. Our students relied on the college for access to technology, for computer access. We have computer labs across our system, information commons in four different campuses that our students used to access on a very regular basis, 18 to 20 hours a day in some cases. So with the closing, the rapid, the sudden closing of our campuses, we went out immediately and purchased 1,500 laptops to create a loaner laptop program because we knew right away if we didn't have access to technology, if we couldn't give it to our students, they'd have to drop out of school. We could have lost up to 50% of our students. So we purchased an emergency purchase in early March of laptops, and we have been loaning laptops out. But then we found out our st students did not have Wi-Fi. We had our students doing remote live from Taco Bell parking lots, from outside of their local Walmarts, because they could not get access at home. They didn't have the money. We used CARES Act funding to help with Wi-Fi. We used CARES Act funding to help with food and rent and things like that. But we also have a large number of students who weren't eligible for CARES Act. So at Union County College, we went out and had a pretty successful student emergency relief fund uh, campaign where we were able to raise money so that no student at Union County College is barred access to education on the basis of not being able to get Wi-Fi. We can get Wi-Fi to every one of our students, either through CARES Act or through institutional funding. We know in this day and age, Wi-Fi is a basic need for college students along with food clothing, and shelter. Uh, I, I know the affordability challenge is, is broad, uh, and we've obviously seen the data showing that uh, you know, the job uh, and income impacts have been worst felt, uh, most felt by Black and Latino and other lower income uh, students. What, what else can the college do to help on the affordability challenge? I mean, anything in the works that you've been, you've been trying to do to, to help? I mean, I know this is, this is not easy, and it's probably not that Union County has a lot of money to burn at this point. Well, we, we have a couple major initiatives for affordability because it's such a critical factor for us. We know 
finance is the obstacle. Finance is the barrier for our students. So we took a bold move two years ago, year and a half ago, and we went with Cengage Unlimited to address the textbook expense problem. We know that the average textbook costs well over $100. So we have, at Union County College, we've signed up with Cengage Unlimited for a one-year subscription fee of $130 students get access, unlimited access, to over 20,000 titles in the Cengage portfolio. So our students are saving hundreds of dollars every year on textbooks. That's the first thing. We created a flat rate tuition for full-time students. So it's a model that is classic in four-year colleges, but for some reason community colleges generally haven't adopted it. Whether you take 12 credits or you take 18 credits, you pay the same flat rate, full-time tuition rate. This gives ambitious students, students who are highly motivated, an opportunity to make up time, maybe graduate in three semesters instead of two semesters, but it definitely helps with the affordability issue. In the past, we have focused, our primary focus at Union is graduation rates. We want to help our students get across the finish line. We know that if we can get our residents a college degree, if we can get these students across the finish line, their lifetime earnings will increase significantly. So we believe part of our affordability initiative is tied to our student success initiative. We know we've got to get them across the finish line. And if we can do it in a shorter period of time, it will save them money. Our flat rate tuition is a critical part of that affordability option at Union. A lot of questions right now about impact on enrollment in the fall. Also, shifting interests in programs, uh, you know, shorter term certificates, whether or not they'll be of more interest, folks you know, looking at different fields. Anything you've seen, any shifts in kind of where students are headed? In community colleges across the country, I know certainly here in New Jersey, we've been waiting for the big rush of students who would be fleeing from the four-year colleges and entering our campuses. It, they didn't show up. It didn't happen. So we did not see the big bump in enrollment. As a matter of fact, we see a decline in enrollment. Our enrollment declines about 7% as of today about approximately 7%. We are concerned about these enrollment patterns. 20 years ago, Paul, if you had asked me, I would have given you the old adage, community college enrollments are inverse, are like beer sales, like beer sales, inversely proportional to the economy. But that pattern is out the window. The economy is in the tank and our enrollment is continuing to decline. And we believe it's because of the uncertainty in our nation, the uncertainty in our state, and the uncertainty in our community, all tied to this pandemic. People are afraid. People are afraid to spend money. People need stability. And what we want to do at Union and at all of New Jersey's community colleges is to allow the community college system to be the point of stability in our communities and to welcome people here. Come here, come to Union County College, and let's get our economy back on track. Let's get people back to work. Let's get people trained for the jobs that will exist in this post-COVID world we'll be living in. I'm down in Washington, and who knows what's going to happen with a possible future federal stimulus. I know community college folks are pushing hard for part-time students to count more in those formulas if anything does happen. Uh, obviously, uh, state budgets are a tricky situation as well. I mean, what, would you, what do you need and what would you like to see from the federal and state government? I know that could be a long list. We need funding from the federal government. The state government doesn't have the ability to, to produce money, and I know New Jersey is not unlike other states in the nation, suffering from significant decreases in revenues. We need federal help, and that help, we need that federal help to the, come in the form of financial help. Our students are the ones who are going to end up bearing the burden of this without some additional federal stimulus dollars. And that we need dollars to go to the colleges. The CARES Act funds, 
were terrific because they split the funds. Some of those funds went to the students, some of those funds to direct student aid, and some directly to the college aid. CARES Act funding like that is critical for our ability to transform ourselves so that we can serve the students during times like this. Those CARES Act dollars gave us the ability to set up high flex classrooms, Cisco classrooms for us to do remote live. Those CARES Act dollars have enabled us to set up a virtual desktop in infrastructure. So regardless of whether a student is on our campus or they could be home in their basement, they're gonna have access to expensive software. That federal money is a lifeline, not just for the colleges, but a lifeline for our students. And we're hopeful, certainly in New Jersey, that our uh, legislative, our congressional delegation is gonna be able to influence some of that, those decisions and get some more stimulus dollars into our colleges. Well, Margaret, uh, I know you're, you're dealing with a lot, uh, so I really appreciate you taking time to talk with me. Um, and let's keep in touch. I'm hoping you know the fall treats you and your students well. Thank you, Paul, very much. And thank you for the great work that you are doing as a journalist. We as Americans need great journalists and we appreciate in higher ed, certainly we appreciate the work you do at Inside Higher Ed. So thanks, thanks for, for saying that. this opportunity. Appreciate it. This episode is sponsored by Cengage. From online to high flex learning, Cengage supports your changing pedagogy at scale. Learn more at Cengage.com slash institutional. That's C-E-N-G-A-G-E dot -E com slash institutional. That's it for this episode of The Key. Thanks for listening. I'll be back next week. A couple episodes in the works. I'll be here and I hope you'll be as well. <laughs>